Hi, I'm Eric Ostro. Live with the Lortel is about to start. For season two, while theaters are dark, we are discussing with our guests their thoughts on the reckoning the theater community is facing for systemic racism and their vision for the future of the American theater. To broaden our perspective, I am sharing my platform with co-hosts from the BIPOC community. We offer these conversations to help us learn and to start the healing process. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Live at the Lortel. Uh, I'm so excited um, and welcome everybody, everybody here on our new platform of YouTube. Um, I hope you enjoy this evening. Uh, I'm going to get right started because we have so much to talk about today. So let me bring on my co-host for the day, my dear friend, Joy D. Michelle. Joy, welcome. Hello, lovely. How are you? I'm good. I'm really good and really, really excited. <laughs> Self. I'm fantastic. I'm excited about today's guest. I know you are. So why don't you do the honor of introducing her? Um, well, um, we have Ms. Anna DeVere Smith, and she is the writer of many prolific plays. And I'm sure you have the list of um, prestigious awards that she's won um, throughout the years. And she is the mother of what I would call the, the docudrama. And uh, I'm excited to have her on today and talk about her process, um, talk about her work as an artist, and also talk about the way things are right now. So I'd love to get her input about everything that's happening in the world. Welcome, Anna. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. Of course. It's such an honor to have you. Like I was saying before, uh, you were really on, on top of our list of people we wanted. And I'm, I'm actually glad it worked out now with what's going on in the country. <laughs> and I, uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, I'm, I'm very grateful you're here. Let's talk about a, a little bit um, about the pandemic, you know, where you were and how it affected maybe what you were working on and where'd you flee or not flee? How are you doing? I'm doing okay. Um, I was working on a television show, um, uh, uh, Shonda Rhimes' new show, uh, not not Bridgerton, but another one that's not out yet. And, you know, there was talk outside in the world about things shutting down. And, um, you know, all of a sudden they, they called them a meeting of like everybody which when everybody's all in one room, that's a lot of people on any set and, you know, said, well, we don't know what's going to happen. We're going to send you home now and then we'll see. And then we shut down, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, that's my biggest memory about it was that big meeting. Um, I was standing right next to Kate Burton, mm -hmm. who I'm a big fan of, Me too. actress, as you know, mm -hmm. and on the other side, one of my favorite PAs ever, a kid from New Orleans called Jimmy. And I, I don't know how to get a hold of Jimmy. I don't know what happened to Jimmy, but I was flanked with Jimmy and Kate Burton and just watching the world change hmm. in, in front of our very eyes. Yes. And then I was on lockdown here in New York. I didn't go anywhere. I spent some time in California the summer, but I, I really was uh, in that epicenter part of the New York part of this. Yeah. Um, what was the... I'm sorry, oh, speaking about hearing, um, being where, watching the world change. Um, I heard you use a quote from Toni Morrison about um, knowing when to write. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you mind sharing that? Yeah, quote that's one of my favorite you? quotes ever. I interviewed her at the 92nd Street Y when her book Paradise came out. And um, she, you know, she's very understated. Toni Morrison, um, and she said that she knew she was ready to write when she had something to fret about. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people, journalists, of course, are, they're able to, they have to, they have to meet deadline and whatever it is, it is, right? Uh, I think for some of the rest of us, it takes us longer to make sense of it. And also, you know, by the time, if I write something for the theater, especially since there's no theater right now, uh, you know, I, I would want it to be relevant at the time people see it. So uh, I remember Peter Brook being interviewed um, hmm. after and during the Monica Lewinsky, uh, Bill Clinton story. Hmm. And somehow they called him, I don't know why, some radio station. And he was talking about how, you know, a, a lot of art is done in retrospect. Hmm. 
-hmm. And it, I think it does. Even with my plays that I make, my docudramas, as they've been called, I go when the press have left. You know, I arrive when all the cameras are, are gone to, so that I can talk to people when they still feel like they haven't been heard, that they didn't get to say it all. That's what I want to hear. So when the hubbub kind of dies down is when the good time yeah, to kind of go in and, like and, and let people yeah. talk. But with this pandemic, we just don't, we don't know, right? Like we all thought, oh, we're so happy to have 2021, but it's like, oh. okay, more drama. Yeah, we're, we're not off to a, a, a very good start we're with not 2021. Off to a good start at all. Not even a little. You know, um, last season, Signature Theater um, did uh, Fires in the Mirror um, with my friend Michael. Uh, who was just outstanding and directed by, by my other friend, uh, Sahim Ali. Fabulous it was, artist. I think, uh, just a group of beautiful artists putting your play together. I, um, it, when you were writing the play and I, Joy and I have been going down, you know, the, the very dark um, spin outs of, of going through your career and your life and reading every interview and, watching everything we possibly can. And I rewatched Fires in the Mirror last night. Um, and um, it's interesting the way you talk about it then and the way you talk about it now. Um, will you talk a little bit about where, where you were then as opposed to where you are now when it was remounted? Oh, well, it's really... Um, that's a big question. Well, I know. I, I, uh, well, I, there were a lot of different things happening. Mm -hmm. You know, I was a, 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 a professor at Stanford who didn't have tenure yet, uh, who Stanford, and I will always send up praise to them, you know, let me go away for a year to take a fellowship at Harvard and paid my half my salary. Oh, and wow. so I think one of the really important things about that experience that I think is relevant to a lot of artists who are listening in is thanks to Stanford, thanks to Harvard and a place called the Bunting Institute, which was for women uh, uh, to take a year off. And thanks to my friend Val Smith, who at the time uh, was on leave at U UCLA is now the president of Swarthmore, incredibly dynamic mm. black woman. Um, thanks to all of that, it was the first year of my life I didn't have, uh, the first year of my adult life that I didn't have to go to work every day. Mm -hmm. wow. Critical. Mm -hmm. That's a very important thing to say about writing Fires in the Mirror. And then the other thing to say is that George Wolf had, um, was not yet the head of the public theater, but was doing a festival and took a chance on me. And then another important thing to say is that it was, it was like I had two nights in this festival of doing the show based on not just the interviews of Crown Heights, but but other aspects. And uh, George came backstage and said, that was incredible or uh, extraordinary. That was his big word he used to use then. Cause I didn't know what I was doing, if it had any worth. And the other two people were um, Joanne Acolytus, who was the head of the public theater then, and Antizaki right. Shange, who in mm -hmm. both ways said the stories about Brooklyn. Cause I had a lot of other things in it. And so I have to just, you know, None of us work in a vacuum. And even though my work is a one person show, you know, to this day, I mean, there, there's like a whole bunch of people involved, including, we have to say, the people I interview. Yeah. So, so I think I was a newbie. I had no idea uh, what the significance of what I was doing was. And I was lucky. And I had a lot of people supporting me. Um, when the show came to Signature Theater, uh, I was, uh, I think I was in a different state of my life. Uh, I was grateful that Paige wanted to do it. Um, and, uh, and I thought that, uh, Sahim and Michael did an extraordinary job. And I think I really, you know, Michael is incredibly disciplined and that was a, that, that there were many gifts in that. And one of them was the, uh, artistry of Sahim and his group and the extraordinary discipline of Michael Benjamin Washington, who I know has been on your show. Yeah. Oh, and a dear friend and um, to, to watch his evolution, not only that, but knowing him for so long and then watching him work on this piece of art was, was a, a revelation to me. I mean, I remember sitting in the theater and um, when the lights went out, nobody moved. Uh, we were just all so 
moved by, by what we had seen. What was it like for you to revisit it and sort of watch it from um, the other side? Well, I mean, you know, first of all, it's like the audition process was like my first mm -hmm. time of like watching it from the other side and mm -hmm. watching all these wonderful young actors come in and um, and give it their all. And everybody was so, I mean, they were all so prepared. It was amazing. It was very beautiful and moving experience. So I think with that, and, you know, as I sat there in auditions, you know, it all came back to me, right? right. I mean, I, you know, I still remember the language that these, don't ask me to say it. <laughs> but you know, it you broke it. Like I, I, you know, like all these memories came back from from that time. You were talking about um, your process and how when you were working with George Wolf originally, you get all the material and and then it changes and morphs and it becomes something else. Um, can you talk about the process of mining the story out? Because I know you do lots of interviews, and from those interviews, you then figure out what the story is going to be as opposed to going into it with an agenda. Sure. Well, I mean, first of all, let, let's say that, you know, the director, the first director of Fires in the Mirror was Christopher Ashley. Uh, oh. well, Christopher directed the production um, that was at the public theater that received all the notoriety. George directed the film. Um, uh, you know, and another person who was very important in that process in the the version for the public theater uh, was Tulani Davis. And I don't know if y'all uh, have met Tulani who um, really hit the scene along with Zaki. They were very good friends from Barnett. And uh, Tulani was just extraordinary. She was the dramaturg. And the thing about my work is that I, I it, it's all about conversation. It starts with the conversation of the people that I talked to for Fires in a Mirror, about 50. Uh, for my last show, Notes from the Field, 250. Um, for Twilight, 320. Uh, for House Arrest, 500 and some. Oh and God. now I'm, I'm making an, a new play about girls and uh, who are in rough circumstances, at-risk girls, focusing on them. And I've just started those conversations. And so the first there's a conversation, the whole bunch of conversations I have with the people that I'm interviewing. And then when I go into the rehearsal hall, I have like four or five hours of material. I ask uh, directors each time, um, Leonard Folia being the most recent, to um, you know don't don't worry about what's on the page. Wait till the first read through where you see me you know acting out these people. And then in the room, I like to have people who won't agree. Um, Elisa Solomon, uh, who's the you know great critic and now the head of arts journalism uh, at Columbia is one of those people I like to have in the room. Doreen Kondo, who's a scholar. Um, at USC, I like to have people in the room who are not going to agree. And so after I perform for however many hours they have to watch, uh, they disagree. I listen, I go home, I write another play, I come back until it gets honed down. And at the same time that I'm doing that at, on an intellectual level, I'm also learning it. And so it's a very, um, it's a, it's a process from the very beginning of embodying. And I really think it goes back to the days when humans were in the oral tradition uh, before the first, you know, if we went back and looked to see, and I believe it was, it's in it, what is now Iraq, I think is where the first tablets and the first writing instruments came mm -hmm. to be, right? So the, the, the state I'm in is in a pre-literary state in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the play was performed, I think, at a, at a really con contentious moment in, in American history. Um, how do you think, I know this is a loaded, loaded question, and my apology for all my loaded questions, but there's quite a few. How, how do you think it stands today and where we are? Well, I mean, I think it, the people who came to see it um, in, at the signature felt it was very, very relevant now um yeah, of course sadly and twilight los angeles which was supposed to be on stage in last may of course was not it's been postponed mm -hmm. we're hoping for this fall but everything changes every day doesn't it um you know twilight los angeles uh pbs put it back on the air when george floyd was murdered and many people That's who right. yeah. that felt that it was very relevant and you know in fact it might be a mistake that we constantly say that we're in unprecedented moments because it doesn't give us a chance to appreciate history and doesn't ask us to say that 
keeps us from looking back on history and reflecting to see, well, what did we learn then that we might be able to bring to fore now, you know? Yeah, agreed. Do you Joy. see things, um, the conversation that young artists can have, um, the, the, the work that they put out being very different from the topics that you had to deal with back in the late 80s? For me, it seems like the more things change, the more they stay the same. We're dealing with the exact same stories in the sense of the injustices that's being done around the world. And what kind of tweak can be done so that there's maybe a little inkling of some solutions being made. I know that what you did recently with opening it up, up letting the audience be the second act, um, it allows people to have discussion. Um, is that more of what you'll be doing or is that something that was a one-time thing? Because a lot of time people come to the theater they feel it for the moment, and then they're it, when it's they're, when they're gone, it's gone. And how yeah, can we I mean, I, I don't know if we can do anything about that. I mean, that's one of the things about art, and I think it, the question is is really, um, I suppose, uh, you know, why in human history did we become expressive in a way that is extracurricular, right? You know that you know you got to uh, the men had to go kill things to bring back the meat or the vegetables, uh, depending on what kind of culture it was. And the women had to have the babies and take care of them. But, but for some reason, in addition to that, we have this other activity that we call expression. I think it's dangerous to call it the arts because it sounds so fancy when, you know, children can do it. <laughs> children love to do it. They're free to do it. That's what they do. They make up stories. Yeah. They dance. They sing. They love to do it. So we shouldn't be so busy calling ourselves the arts, right? It's like a fundamental thing we can do. And there was a geneticist I was crazy about uh, when I taught at Stanford called Marcus Feldman. We would meet every once in a while and talk about stuff. And I had a dog, uh, Memphis, who uh, lived to be 17, and she was a mutt, but she was part Australian cattle dog, and so she would herd people, and and she, you know, she wasn't trained to do that. She'd never been on around any sheep or cows, and so I said to to you know Professor Felt, I said, you know, why? How does Memphis know what to do? I mean, she, did. and he said, um, through DNA. I said, I said, well, how do humans know what to do? And he said, through culture. Uh, so this is, you know, it's very, very basic to us, um, this thing. I drifted from your question, Joy. But, you know, um, yeah, what was your question? You wanted to know about, well, so here's my point about why in writing notes from the field, which is about the school of prison pipeline, I only performed for one hour with extraordinary and quite handsome uh, bass player called Marcus Shelby on stage with me. And then, you know, we both kind of said, hey, everybody, uh, we come from a tradition of call and response, field hollers, blues shouts. So we've been hollering and shouting for an hour and y'all have been quiet. So this problem of poor kids getting thrown out of school and into jail is not just my business, it's your business. And so we sent people for the whole run at Berkeley Rep and also at the American Repertory Theater. We sent everybody out all over the theater. You know, they were in, you know, the, the you know, we did in Baltimore, they were in paint shops and ART, they're out on the lawn. You know, they were all over the theater to basically say, this is your house too. Doesn't just belong to the artists. Uh, and we pet sent people out um, in group of 20, um, you know, with facilitated conversations. And, you know, I'm sure there was a lot of people who might have felt like, you know what, I just really wanted to come see a play tonight. <laughs> I didn't want to have to be a citizen. Um, but they came, you know, and the point is that there is, there are all kinds of art. And I felt that this problem of children being thrown out of school, uh, poor kids getting thrown out of school and going to right, headed right to that incarceration cycle was something that people needed to take seriously. And it wasn't enough to come and watch me act 
And, you know, in success, they would laugh and cry, which they did. But I wanted them to do more than that. I wanted to make them think about what their proximity was to it. So, you know, that was the beginning of an experiment about audience. And I've been very interested in the potential of arts organizations to uh, think about their publics in different ways. And I do think that that may be one of the outcomes of the pandemic at the end of the pandemic when we come out of retreat you know, this temporary retirement that we're in. Yeah. I think that's a project that uh, particularly nonprofit theaters may be able to take up. I don't see it happen in the for-profit world. No. Um, Eric, do you mind if I jump in again? No, please do. Okay. So in reference to your talking about schools and children and young people, what words of wisdom do you have for the young person who's an artist, who comes from an underserved community, who does not have the means to attend some wonderful university, like at NYU or Stanford or USC or someplace like that, where they can um, really get the guidance and training that they need as an artist. What words of wisdom do you have for them other than get a school loan, like I did? <laughs> get a what? Get a school loan. <laughs> well, I mean, first of all, we should say that uh, talent, talent, pure talent in and of itself, uh, and an aptitude for expression in and of itself is democratic. You know, you could go to Juilliard all you want, but if you ain't got it, you ain't got it. And they can't give it to you, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that I try to make clear to my students right away, um, right away, and I've been teaching for a very long time, is you have it, I don't have it. It's yours. And in this class, you know, the point is for you to get turned on to it that's yours. And the best thing you can do is leave here with more questions about what to do with this thing you have, right? I can't give it to you. I can't really evaluate talent. I can make an environment where you can work, but that's, you know, that belongs to you. And so I think that's something very wonderful. Like you can train to be a lawyer, but you, you, you can't become expressive in the way that artists are expressive if you don't have it inherently. Um, so that's number one. Number two, I mean, I think it needs to come out of, I'll probably be fired for saying this, but I don't think it should stay in these elite, only in these elite environments. This happened in the course of my lifetime. I mean, I went to conservatory. I didn't, you know, luckily I got a scholarship, you know, I got put in the company. I mean, I didn't pay, I didn't have this kind of debt. And I got a fantastic education at a conservatory, not a university. Now, I would say that very carefully because I also know that, you know, really, particularly theater didn't have much of a presence in universities and we belong in universities, but it doesn't need to cost this much because there's no guarantee when you get out, no matter how talented you are, that you're going to be able to make a living. So this has to be really rethought, you know, and that, but this is the main thing they need to do, Joy. Watch the documentary on Amazon about Woody King Jr., who hmm. was a critical part of not just the black theater in the 60s, but the transformative theater of the 60s. And, you know, he grew up, he came from Alabama. He moved to Detroit. His mother went back south to or 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 to work um you know, in, in, in helping make ships and stuff for the war. And, you know, his like cousins and aunts raised him. And he comes out of that. You got to watch that documentary about a kid who didn't have anything, but liked to work, got a job in the, um, you know, in the in making cars in Detroit, but very critical that a lot of our young people aren't interested in went and found his way to a white theater in the suburbs, but because he was willing to say, I'll do anything, I mean, boom, boom, boom. Not only did he become Woody King Jr., he changed the American theater forever. So yes. just go watch that documentary, and that's going to tell you a lot about where your, 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 your curiosity and your energy can get you. Yeah. That doesn't correct the bigger problem about why this has become so expensive. That's wrong. Totally agree. We'll, we'll put that information up on, on the website so people can watch that documentary and that I'm looking forward actually to watching that tonight. And I'm sure you would appreciate you mentioning that. Thank you. I was so gonna blow your mind. 
It's just yeah. blow your mind. Because, you know, I mean, Sidney Poitier, Sidney Poitier did not know how to read. You know how he learned to read? He was washing dishes and a white man who was a dishwasher taught him how to read the newspaper. Mm -hmm. This is why it's so important not to forget about history. Sidney Poitier did not know how to read. Okay? I mean, you know, and Woody was, you know, hanging with Sidney Poitier and all these people. The, um, I have a question which gets a little political, if, if you don't mind, um, because last week was just a horror in what happened, but I think it's, it's, it's relevant. You know, from 1844, when the police department was established in New York City, to our current lifetime with Rodney King, to Freddie Gray, George Floyd, to the storming of the Capitol by many of off-duty officers, the uprising against police brutality has been ongoing. Do you, do you think America is at a point of reckoning of, of any kind? I think that we are in such disarray. I'm not saying anything nobody has read or watched on the news in the last several days, that one of the things we all have to question, every single one of us, what's my part in this? Because I'm beginning to think I don't even know. We keep talking about we got to restore democracy. Well, do we even have democracy? That's right. I mean, I, I kind of think that we're stuck in these very small contexts about what's going on. But this particular last week was such a so broken, so broken, and evidence of the brokenness of the country keeps coming. That, I mean, people walk around saying, what's happening to democracy? What's happening to democracy? But we were already thinking that through this whole election cycle. And that's why, you know, people were dancing in the streets, you know, when, when Biden won. Um, and when you think back of the difference again with, with Gore and Bush, yeah. and this thing that happened and then breaking into the Capitol, it's very, uh, I think it's time for a, I, I don't even want to use the word reckoning because I think we, the problem is we say these things over and over again because we want to make a kind of sense of it and have an official language on it when this is defying language. And maybe we need to be in the heart of it to really think, not, not put it, not here, but, but here of, how bad this is, but but it was bad in the debate between Biden and Trump. Have you ever seen anything like it? No, <laughs> never, no. no. And every time you, we, I think we try to put it in our hearts. It, at least for myself, my heart just keeps getting broken more and more. I mean, we keep uh, watching Tara and and Drek on on the TV and the the debates and last week and it. It just keeps breaking our hearts over and over and over. <sighs> what makes me so afraid <clears throat> is the thought that eventually we'll become numb, and the heart. I think we're numb already. Yeah, I think the heartbreaking part already. of it is like not an issue. But it, here's the thing: heartbreak also can lead to um, outrage. You know. And I mean, not that look, do, do we need any more of that? But it's at some point. I mean, the big question that I cannot answer for you is what causes change. And we're struggling to get, we're struggling to get to some kind of a metamorphosis that we, where we can be reminded uh, that we do believe in American values. But this is kind of like the civil war is being, re, you know, this is showing us the civil war was never over. We've all been living in this, this haze of um, democracy, which really isn't real, and it's becoming a thing for us to see. And for for a certain demographic of people, I think they're super shocked. But for other people, it's just, it is what it is. This is how we've been living. This is what it's been. So I am actually excited about this time because I feel as though I'm in that group of people that's been like, it is what it is, and this is what it's always been. And now you all just now seeing. 
So in that you all just now seeing the light being turned on for other people, that becomes an opportunity for real change because I don't, I don't even have to have the conversation now. I, I don't have to talk about it. Other oh, yeah. About it are now talking about it. Wow. I can just sit back and listen. I can wow. just sit back and watch. That's fantastic. I see what you're saying. Oh, that's very, very interesting. But you know, I also heard something uh, from a, 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 a white person who uh, said this is like the first time that it, it's like you could just the, the the conversation is alive across race in a way, mm -hmm. not held back, that it wasn't even with George Floyd. Mm -hmm. To everybody, to most people, there's no doubt in their mind that this is way over the top. Right. Right. So this is a time, I would say, with, with, with a, this is the time to go and out and talk to complete strangers. And feel, you know, go and talk to some perfect stranger because mm -hmm. you have something to talk about. Right. You have something to talk about. Let me ask you this: in in terms of speaking to complete strangers, and and I do that all the time because I love to talk to people who <laughs> Eric's laughing because I do. He knows I talk to everybody. I love to talk to people who have a different point of view than what I have. However, you take on, you embody these different characters and these different people. What do you do um, to release the emotion, the behavior, the story, the trauma of other of these characters so that it's not living in you later on? Because you interview a lot of people with a lot of traumatic stories. So what do you do to take care of yourself? Well, I mean, I'm an actor, right? So there's um, part of the skill set does um, anticipate that. So it's like, you could ask me, uh, you could ask an actress who's playing Medea, how they do that. Or uh, mm -hmm. for me, you know, I never got a chance to be in for color girls who considered suicide with the rainbow is enough. Uh, but I don't know if you remember the woman in red. Now that was a part that if the, 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 the woman, Trisana Beverly really, you know, put that role on the map of the woman telling the story of her husband yes. throwing the children out the window. And, um, Wow, imagine what it was like to do that every night, you know? Right. And so I think there there are lots of parts like that. Um, in and and so what what do I do? I get to the theater at two or three o'clock in the afternoon for an eight o'clock show, um, you know, getting ready. Um, after the show, I greet guests, I go home, I go to bed, I get up, I go to the gym. So it's a very, um, which really was also what I learned with Fires in the Mirror, because it was the first time I had a run of what I do. And the fact that I'm switching characters and some of the people do things that are vocally, any vocal coach would say, mm -hmm. don't do that, right? They're using <laughs> their voices with ways that are like, oh my God. And in the voice is joy, as you say, that that trauma. But also, the show is designed in a way that um, you know, just the general principles of how you design something. You know, what's going to be the eleven o'clock number, right? The eleven o'clock number is this place where the audience, you know, is really with you. Whether that's a song that somebody sings in a musical, or so that that there's the eleven o'clock number is even a place where it's all getting released, not just from me, but with the help of the audience, right? And my my friend, the late Jesse Norman. Um, I would go see her sing, you know, particularly in Europe, and the French just went insane about her. And um, and and so I saw her once in Paris and at the at the Salle Playal. And and at the last thing she sang was this beautiful love song of Poulenc, uh, the, the the Road to Love. And those French people were just like. They were like babies almost sucking their thumbs. Mm. And I said, man, they were just like, and she said, well, I got to send, I have to send these people home some kind of way. I got to get them to go home. Opera people. Although, I have to send them home some kind of way. So it's like, you, you know, when you design the thing itself that you get people uh, a certain way, and then you got to change it. So the you're putting the audience on an emotional road, and I'm on that with them. Mm -hmm. so that in itself is a kind of a mechanism for moving the stuff around, if that makes sense, Joy. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Absolutely, and I miss that that roller coaster, that ride. I mean, it it's uh, it's a real void in all of our lives not to have theater now, not to be able to go on the road. Um, I want to remind our audience. Um, I know there's some questions, and and we're going to get to them, but I, I I definitely want to get to this one thing with Anna, and that's about um, those three questions that came from the linguists, and I I think they're so important, especially for the young students that watch and want to create work like you had. Um, will you tell a little bit the story about the three questions and the linguists that you met? And I, I just think it's really important and I, I want it documented on, a, on our podcast. Okay, well, um, I, uh, the big thing I want to tell everybody who's uh, a young artist is, and I've alluded to it earlier, which is that don't go to school for answers, go to school for your questions. Any great artist, has a question. I didn't, I didn't really understand it that way. So I talked to Bryce Martin, who's a great, great uh, abstract expressionist painter. And so there's a question in the work. So go to school to find your question. That's number one. And my question, I left the conservatory with two huge questions. One, I wanted to know why in Shakespeare, they tell you just say the words, please, <laughs> and the, the, everything will come. Say the speak the speech. I pray thee, right? Shakespeare. Himself. That number one. Why is that? That I don't have to have like this psychological realism. That the language itself is going to take me where. That's number one. Number two. I did have a problem with psychological realism. I did not think it was necessarily you know, culturally universal. There were so many cultural assumptions in this method that came out of Russia in the late 19th century. So um, I had two big questions and I wanted to, I, I decided the way I can learn about it is listening to people talk, but I need to get them to talk in a way that their language will take me there. And I knew that had something to do with people breaking patterns. Say, for example, not so much now, but five years ago, all my students ended a, ended a sentence with a question. So almost like the more expensive the education, the more they wanted to sound like they weren't so sure. I know we got to get to the question. I went to this. I don't know, some conference in Arizona with which had a lot of women judges and stuff and, you know, women lawyers wanting to know how to be, you know, how to law students wanting to know, you know, how to be successful lawyers, you know, women lawyers. And one of the judges said, well, first of all, don't state everything like a question. Your Honor, I think I think my client is not guilty. Right. So, <laughs> so if I were to interview somebody doing that all the time. Right. I would I would listen until they stopped doing that. <laughs> then I would write, then I know something's going to happen, right? Or Bertolt Brecht wrote an extraordinary essay called Street Scene, which is about how if you go in the street after an accident, people describing the accident, you are going to automatically start performing. So Michael, how will I get people, real people to just perform for me? And at a party, a, a linguist that I do not, I did not learn her name, don't know her name, and yet she changed my life. We were standing around talking and she told me she was a linguist and she asked what I did. And I was embarrassed to say I was an actor because of course I wasn't working. And I said, well, what I really want to do is um, I want to be able to talk to somebody for about an hour, no longer, and get them to change their vocal mannerisms. And she said, well, I'm going to give you three questions that will guarantee that will happen. And the questions that she gave me were, have you ever come close to death? Have you ever been accused of something that you did not do? And do you know the circumstances of your birth? So the first one of my shows that I made like this would not, it wasn't a one person show. I literally walked up to people in the streets of New York and said, I know an actor who looks like you. If you give me an hour of your time, I'll invite you to see yourself performed. And there were 20 actors and 20 real people. Meredith Monk, the fabulous composer, was one. The lady up the street who had a secondhand shop. Uh, the lifeguard at the night at the 63rd Street Y was one. Um, a hairdresser, stuff like that. And it worked. And indeed, we talk about whatever. Talk about swimming lanes. And somewhere in it, I would ask those three questions, and lo and behold. Uh, like really interesting things would start to happen linguistically. I don't ask those questions anymore. 
Um, but it's an experiment, you know, for you and your listeners. Uh, just drop those questions in and see how people start to behave. Before we go to the, the audience's question, I want to ask you one last question um, from myself. And that is, I have I've have been fortunate to have a lot of um, mentors and people to give me advice about being in different spaces, Woody King being one of them, Woody King Jr. being one of them. Um, for those people who ha who are outside of that sphere of being able to have those people to speak into their spirit in that kind of way, who may be listening, what would be your advice to the young artist that gets an opportunity to be in these traditionally white institutions and may not be treated fairly? What is your advice about how to maneuver that, how to get through that? There's somebody there. There's somebody there. Uh, uh, people are not completely tone deaf. Um, there's somebody there. And you, ha you have to be a seeker. It's good to be a seeker in life anyway. And so there's somebody there. And then the other thing is there, the there is so huge. And you never know. I mean, I can remember going to a Picasso retrospective in the early 1980s. Now, I never met Picasso, but that was a teacher. Studs Terkel, before I did meet him and become very good friends with him, the great journalist, his play working was a teacher. Um, so see all kinds of art and find your mentors. I used to just love to uh, listen um, to the the um, uh, 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 to interviews, like any you know, I didn't listen to Barbara Walters interviews, just to hear what happened when people took off on their own and became original. One of the big interviews, which was hugely important in my work before I met the linguist, was uh, Sophia Loren mm -hmm. on Jenny Carson. Mm -hmm. Shocking, such an amazing interview about identity, right? So it's like. The mentors are there, Joy, if you know your question. Mm. That's the truth. You need to know your question and you will find the mentors and you will find people who are very excited to engage with you with your question, but have a real question. Mm. Thank you. Um, we have to get uh, to a couple of uh, questions from our audience. Um, one is from an actual another podcast person, Jennifer, from the MILF podcast. I would love to hear more about your upcoming project um, about at-risk young women. Can you speak to the evolution of women's voices in art? Well, I mean, the, the evolution of oh, women's I'm sorry, uh, women's voices, all right, there's another part, in art over the time of your career. I beg your pardon, sorry. I Jennifer. mean, it's a very cute, the, the second question is, way too big, but um, I'm glad you're asking it. And it means to me that um, there's so many, so much richness that you get to explore right now, especially if you look at all the arts um, and people that I'm finding uh, every day that I, I never knew about. Um, I'm becoming very interested right now in extraordinary drummer, Terry Lynn Carrington, who's having a fantastic <laughs> year right now. She was a prodigy. She went to Berkeley College of Music when she was 11 years mm -hmm. old. And, you know, she's nominated for a Grammy this year. She's got the jazz master, all this stuff. So there's always people and people who, um, there's just so many people. There's just so many. And, you know, and, and to go back in history, of course, I've been so influenced by uh, Lorraine Hansberry, you know, who, who wouldn't be. So many, 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 many. Um, so I couldn't even begin to list them, but th there was a preface to that part of the question. What was the first part of the question? I want someone to pro, um, it is, I would love to hear more about your upcoming project about yeah. that risk. Oh, so girls. So I, as I alluded to my last play, Notes from the Field, was about the school to prison pipeline. And I interviewed 250 people in uh, six geographic areas in the United States. Um, and I went to Finland because Finland supposedly, Finland and Singapore have like the best education systems in the world. So if you're looking at everything that's wrong, you gotta go find out where it's right. Mm -hmm. um, and and in that course of those 250 interviews, uh, I, I would say if you if you said to people, draw a picture of a kid who's in trouble in the United States, most likely that child is going to be a black or brown boy. Now, of course, I learned a lot about the 
outrageous situation of Native Americans in doing in the, this as well. And I, I ran, I, you know, I met some girls who uh, got in trouble. Um, but I'm interested in the whole ecosystem, not to diminish anything that we think about the vulnerability of boys and young men, but there's a whole ecosystem. And also, I think girls have a right to be bad too. Bad in every way. A character's not interesting if they're all good. <laughs> I think girls have a right to get naughty. And there's mm -hmm. even a whole, there's a whole area of literature now of uh, looking at the transgressive black girl, not just the magical black girl, right? Mm -hmm. And that there are girls out there, girls and young women who need to experience an extended sisterhood. And I, 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 I feel like I want to know about my young sisters. I want to know more about them. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, I, I, I plan to do it by creating uh, performance workshops where, where they tell me about themselves, not just the pathology, but I, I just want to know all about them. And so that's the, this new project is going to be about young ladies who are at risk. Um, this is a question from the audience. Um, this is from um, Juliet Jeffers. And she's asking, what, when someone approaches you with a role, what draws you to the project? You know, um, I think really what, honestly, what draws me to a project is, is what's the whole team around it more than the role itself. And I've been, um, to the extent that I've worked in popular culture and, and I, I haven't that much as compared to many of the other people you're interviewing, because I've been very involved in my own work and trying to make it better and learn things and stuff. Always experimenting. Um, yeah, I've been very lucky about the sort of groups of people I work with, you know, that have been on the West Wing. That it was a fantastic group of, of people. Uh, to my first time in Shondaland was with For the People and now with her new show. That's an extraordinary organization. Shondaland's an extraordinary organization. Yeah. Nurse Jackie, that was like to work with Edie Falco. And yeah. It's like all of those people. That's really what draws me to it. it um, we have one more. Um, one more question from the audience. Um, from Jack Watson, fires in the mirror, what still sticks with you from your interview with Carmel Cato? That's a wonderful question. And I was just thinking about him. Well, you know, and this has to do with the whole question of like how I decide to do something and how I put it together. And when I came to New York that year, that was the first year in my adult life that I didn't have to work every day. And George Wolf had invited me to be in his festival. And he had said, well, when you come to New York, what do you think you'll write about? And I said, oh, I don't know. Guess I'll chase ambulances. And I had something like four train tickets down from Boston. And um, there, at that time in the early 90s, there was a lot about the what we then call the Korean grocery stores that are on the corner. They don't exist in the same way anymore. So I did some looking at that and blah, blah, went over to Crown Heights. And when I got the interview with Mr. Cato, it was a kind of a rainy night. He was in a uh, raincoat. We, we talked outside in the street. And the story was breathtaking. And he was answering all three questions. Hmm. And I wasn't asking those questions. Have you ever come close to death? Yes. He stood there while his son was dying. Have you ever been accused of something that you did not do? They were beating him while he was trying to get to the kid. His kid. He said, it's my kid. They're trying to get there. And then we're standing out there and I'm listening. And he says, I'm a special person. Hmm. I said, why is that? I born by my foot. He hit it all. <laughs> I was like, wow. what? 
<laughs> he was like, not only is this, wow. this is what I have to make the play about. And this man has to have the last word. Also, because if you go back and you look at the press about that, mm -hmm. the boy, Gavin Cato, becomes less and less relevant in a story that's about all of these politicians jockeying to run the story, to tell the story. And the boy and his his little cousin who was right there, Angela, she, she disappears completely. These children just disappear. So yeah, he answered all three questions without being asked. Wow, amazing, amazing memory. Go ahead, Joy, I know you got a question coming right. I always have questions. Mm -hmm. For Miss Anna, Anna Devere. <laughs> so Anna. My, um, my my question that I have about um, the what's happening right now with casting, there's a lot of conversation about people being of that gender or that a person being of that particular background, and I know that lots of people want to take on doing your shows, and I know that recently you've looked at having different people of different backgrounds and different genders and taking on this. And I think it helps with um, looking at biases when you see it coming out of the mouth of somebody who is not that. Um, what are your thoughts about being able to continue to do that? Because I, or do you think that that's something that you'd have to now adhere to this new way of doing things? Well, I mean, I think it gets back to the, the group. Who's the group doing it and what's their mission? And, um, you know, how true are they to their mission and do they feel the mission? And what's that mission? That mission could be, uh, you know, August Wilson made it pretty clear he didn't want anybody but black people to ever do his plays. I think he allowed a production in China. Um, that's his mission. Mm. He's the originating artist. He, he, that's his mission. So, and, and I, I think it's important for uh, the, the artists listening to this, that they understand that they have to decide the same thing about having a question. You, you have to decide what you believe in and nobody can decide that for you. And a trend can't decide that for you. Uh, a movement can't decide that for you. And, um, you know, you have to find the right people to bring around you that want to do the work that you believe in. And I think that's like one of the biggest things. And no, no school teaches us that. Like, what do you believe in? And how do you bring people around, even temporarily, to want to build something uh, with you around that belief system? Just temporarily, you know, two months, that's it, whatever. Um, I don't think we spend any time with our uh, students enough time doing that. But I think if you know, if you don't know your question when you get out of school, and you don't know what you're willing to fight for, you haven't made the best of that expensive education. Mm -hmm. That you could still be paying for today, correct? Right. Um, you know, I, I read something um, about your grandfather which I found really, really fascinating. And I loved um, what he says um, about if you say the word often enough, it becomes you. We talk a little bit about that. And well, yeah, no, that's my pedagogy. I mean, that's what yeah. I'm doing. That's my technique is right. that I'm just saying the words the same way, you know, when you have to, you don't have to do it in TV, for example. Uh, in TV, you learn the text, you come in, you, you know, you, you're, you're helping the director tell the story. And usually they come over and say, could you pick up the pace? <laughs> yes, <laughs> about like trying to sound like a real person there. It's like, could you just pick it up? Mm -hmm. I think everybody needs to pick it up and you kind of know it's you, right? <laughs> pick, up pick up the pace. So, so um, but, uh, you know, so grandpa, um, uh, that idea, if you say a word often enough, it becomes you. That's my technique, right? Is that I spend hours and hours and hours uh, saying those words that people have said to me. And then lo and behold, I start to feel something. I would never presume to say I feel like them, but I find a connection to them. And more importantly, the audience, in, if I've done well, 
feels a connection to that individual whose words I've said so often, like a mantra, the audience feels a connection to someone who they might have never been able to imagine they would feel any connection to whatsoever. That's that's the madness I'm involved in. I want people mm. in the audience to think, wow, I never thought I could even want to hear from that person, mm -hmm. let alone feel something for them. In your interviews with people, have you ever interviewed someone who um, whose story was very important to tell, but was very hard to listen to, that had a completely different point of view than yours? Well, I, I interviewed a woman um, in the Maryland Correctional Institute for Women who, Paulette Jenkins, who um, sat on her bedside with her baby while her boyfriend beat her little girl. Uh, and she heard in the bathtub and she heard her little girl's head hitting the bathtub. And the next morning, the little girl was dead. And he, the boyfriend said, we can't let nobody find out about this. And so she came up with a plot, helped him. This really happened in Baltimore. My mother knew the whole story. Um, and they dressed the little girl uh, up. And they went to the mall and said, we can't find our little girl. This is what she had on. And so it was one of those searches all over the city looking for her, Maisha. And they took her, uh, they drove out to I-95 with her baby and her other son. And they laid the little girl on the shoulder of the highway. And, you know, and she says, it's so powerful. She says, all I could do was look in the rear view mirror while he laid her on the shoulder of the highway. My own child, I let that happen to. And I mean, that, as I was sitting there with Paula Jenkins in the prison, hearing that story, it was absolutely unfathomable. Uh, and to me, that's, uh, you know, that's maybe deeper than like a belief, you know, like I, I portray a rodeo cowboy called Brent Williams, who I got to know very, very well. I mean, you know, Brent, I, I got to call him about what just happened. I mean, Brent, nobody has different opinion about the world than me and Brent, but I felt that I, he and I found a connection. I portrayed him in a show and as part of my mission, which is to chase that which is not me, to connect to that which I don't believe in. With the case of Paulette Jenkins, I would say it's much, much a deeper enterprise. What do you think, Joy, when I say that? I mean, you know, it's... it's uh, the, when that came up, when you were saying that, what came up for me is where do you have to go to, because I know I'm a very empathetic person and I wouldn't want to, the person to feel judged because I want to get the truth of their story. Um, but I don't know if I could not feel emotion while she's telling me that story. So where do you go where you can emotionally cut it off and just really be the interviewer and not feel what is being shared with you? Well, uh, one of the people, back to the person who was asking about women artists who uh, I learned a lot from is the late Mary Ellen Mark, She's an extraordinary photographer. You've seen some of her photographs. She actually took an extraordinary photograph of Lachance. Uh, You know, Lachance Gooding's husband was killed uh, in 9 yeah, And you probably, you may have seen this amazing photo of Lachance and her two little girls lying in bed. Um, Soon after that happened, Mary Ellen Mark took that picture. And in the preface to her book, American Odyssey, she writes that the camera gives her the necessary distance to get close to strangers. So mm -hmm. what I am doing when I'm sitting in the Maryland Correctional Institute for Women, listening to Paulette Jenkins, I'm riveted to this story, which 
could be a great play. I mean, it could be like Medea. I'm riveted to the story and her telling of it. I don't have time to judge Paulette Jenkins. I'm grateful that she wants to talk to me, a perfect stranger, who one of the other prisoners said, said you look like a lawyer. <laughs> we need to get you something else. <laughs> you need a leather jacket, right? I mean, all these women completely size me up, right? Of course. Or a punk. And that Paulette Jenkins wanted to talk to me? That's what I'm there for. That's what I'm here for, is to be your first audience, your best audience. If you can give me a chance to do that, then why would I waste time judging you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a, speaking of books, um, uh, from Abby Goldman asks, um, are there three books that you would recommend to our audience to read before seeing your next play? Or um, even more so, are, are there any three books that you would read? Um, I would even go far as to say about, you know, before we wake up tomorrow to what the heck is going on. I mean. Yeah, I mean, I think that there is no book for what the heck is going on. <laughs> okay, that's a good point. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, we're the book for what the heck is going on. Um, I was very uh, affected this summer by reading Michael Sandel's new book, uh, The Tyranny of Merit, mm. uh, which is the, you know, the underlying question in that book is whatever, what has happened to the common good? You know, I think that's a book about our, um, our values uh, uh, that has, uh, has meant a lot to me. Um, but I, we don't, there is no book about this, you know. We're living it. We're living it. Yeah, we're writing it now. Um, Joy, uh, you know, our hour has unfortunately come to an end. It's, mm -hmm. it's gone so, so quickly. But I know, Joy, if you have one quick question, um, go ahead and get it in, my, my darling. My question is so technical. <laughs> um, in terms of getting their stories, do you typically get them to sign an agreement or what do you do to protect yourself legally? Um, when yeah, well, I mean, I, I try to remember to, well, there, there's a release, period, the end. And, and and anybody who's thinking about doing this, you got to get your own release, that, you know, with your own lawyer that serves you, very important to invest that money. Um, you know, I try to remember in the beginning. In the beginning, I used to make sure I started every interview by saying, uh, now I'm going to, is it okay if I record this? Uh, I would like to be able to repeat something that you said. Is that okay? And um, please tell me if there's something you don't want me to repeat. Now I just, you know, I, now, but that was back when I traveled all by myself. Like when I wrote Fires in the Mirror, I was running around Brooklyn in the dead of night alone and have any staff. You know, now I travel with other people. Somebody's responsible for getting the release and stuff like that. But you do, well, I don't know. Talk to your lawyer. I mean, the law changes about this kind of thing all the time. Mm -hmm. um, Anna DeVere Smith, thank you so much for spending this hour with us. Um, it, well, it, I hope that you all um, have all the funding that you need to uh, do a lot of this in this era. You know, I think it's really important right now where we're stopped to ask people in our culture, the thing we love so much, mm -hmm. um, that many actors and we all miss so much, warriors who want to get back down into the battlefield right away, um, even if we don't have all of our limbs, we just want to work. Uh, I think this is such a marvelous thing that you're doing, and I hope you're talking to all kinds of people and stage managers. We uh, sure are. I mean, watchers, uh, uh, donors, all the people who are in the education departments. I hope you're talking to everybody in our culture um, because it would be a great gift to be able to look back on this time where we've stopped. And through your hospitality, which I've certainly um, enjoyed so much today and your, your questions, that we can reflect on what the theater was because we don't know what it's going to be like when we come back. Correct. Well, I believe that you're a gift. 
uh, your gift to us and, and the American theater and theater for everybody and uh, many, many young people who, who you know, look up to you and, and what you do. So I want to thank our audience for coming. Um, ask people to like the video and subscribe. Please subscribe to our channel. And uh, next week, uh, there will be no show because in remembrance of Martin Luther King Day. But on Monday, January 25th at 7 p.m., we will be interviewing Philippa Sue. So um, thank you all again for audience. Thank you, Joy. You are a light in my life. Um, and um, Anna Devere Smith, thank you from the bottom of my heart. I Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so much. Have a great night, everybody. We'll see you in two weeks. Good God night. bless you and please stay safe.